Next on Night Beat, the serial carjackers strike again. But now San Francisco police say they know who they are and they have the pictures to prove it. And fighting back against annoying telemarketers will tell you how to make money off the people who are trying to make money off you. Night Beat starts now. Live from the news leader in Northern California, News Center 4, Night Beat. Here's the very latest. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pete Wilson. And I'm Pam Moore. Thank you for joining us tonight. A major break tonight in the search for the kidnappers who robbed the San Francisco woman and drove her in the trunk of her car to Southern California. Police have identified the two ex-convicts and a female companion who they think are responsible. Night Beat's Nikki Jackson is in our newsroom and has late details for us. Nikki. Pam, San Francisco police tell me the suspects are from somewhere in the East Bay. Of course, they don't know where they are right now, so police are hoping you might help catch them. It was Friday, November 20th, when Alice Tennyson stepped off a plane at San Francisco's airport. She was very traumatized after spending three days blindfolded and sometimes locked in the trunk of her car while her kidnapper stole money using her ATM card. Alice Tennyson says two black men and a woman were her captors. Now San Francisco police are looking for three people who may have been involved in at least five similar incidents. They're being looked at in connection with a number of robberies, kidnappings, and carjackings, both in the Bay Area and in Southern California. Todd Anthony Williams is wanted for parole violations. He's a black male, 36 years old, 5 feet 9 inches tall and 165 pounds. He may now have a goatee or mustache. Joseph O'Neill is also wanted for parole violations. He's also African-American, 30 years old, 6 feet tall and 200 pounds. He now has a shaved head and possibly some facial hair. And Lisa Raina Johnson is wanted for questioning. She's black, 32 years old, 5 foot 8 and 165 pounds. She now wears her hair pulled back. We believe that they're armed and dangerous and that there's a uh, threat to the public safety. Alice Tennyson was abducted early in the morning after she parked her car in front of her office in downtown San Francisco. After being blindfolded and wrapped in duct tape, she was thrown into the trunk of her car. Her captors made the first withdrawal from an ATM in Berkeley. Then, three days later, Tennyson was found in Laguna Beach. She was left in a park, duct taped to a bench. On Saturday night, another woman was carjacked, pistol whipped, and robbed in Escondido near San Diego. And reliable sources tell News Center 4 there was another attempted carjacking in Las Vegas on Sunday. The woman in that incident was reportedly beaten. I spoke with a friend of Alice Tennyson's today. She says Tennyson is, is of course, still very traumatized and that she got very upset when she heard about the Escondido case. Pam. Mm, all right. Thank you very much, Nikki. We should add that police have not said if they think the two <clears throat> suspects were involved in the similar kidnapping and robbery of a woman in the garage of a San Francisco Costco store. And on to other things, still no sign of a missing 39-year-old Oakland woman, but there has been a development in the case. Regina Lovings was last seen on Thursday, as we told you, reported missing when she failed to show up for work in Oakland the following day. A homeless couple who used Lovings' credit card at this San Francisco market were arrested, but police are convinced now the pair found the card, along with other Loving property, and they know nothing of her disappearance. The missing Alameda girl we told you about last night, 11-year-old Chiquita Holmes, was found this morning sleeping in a park just a couple blocks from her home. Worried friends and neighbors passed out leaflets yesterday, but police say the girl spent two cold nights in the park after an argument with her parents. She was given a precautionary checkup at the hospital. She's okay. Well, Bay Area airports were put to the test on this busy travel day, and they all passed with ease. You are looking right now at a live picture from SFO, where the last of the holiday travelers are waiting to catch their planes. More than 100,000 people passed through here today. Weather cooperated, keeping delays to a minimum. The rest of us stay-at-homers may have rain to contend with this weekend, though. Steve Raleigh has a brief look at our forecast. Steve. Well, to continue on your analogy, uh, Mother Nature gets a grade of an A, the way things worked out today uh, for anybody who is traveling, certainly around here. And, you know, first thing in the morning, things are looking pretty good, too. You can see most of the moisture heading to the north. It looks pretty good if you're heading right out first thing in the morning. Another story, though, later in the day, you'll see the jet stream. This little belly is going to be moving over the top of us. And as a result, before the end of the day, we're going to see some showers tomorrow on Thanksgiving, a few more drops into Friday, but a better weekend ahead. 
So uh, overall, not bad though. First part of the day tomorrow if you're traveling in the morning. We'll have the details for you coming up in a few minutes, guys. All right, Steve, thank you. A lot of folks who are preparing for tomorrow's meal, as usual, are waiting until the last minute. A long line circled around a honey-baked ham store in San Francisco tonight. Even inside, it was pretty slow going. For a live look at the procrastinators, let's check in with Night Beat's Laura Anthony, who's in Berkeley tonight. Hi, Laura. Hi, Pam. Well, there are still quite a uh, few procrastinators out here tonight. Not as many as we saw a few hours ago. Uh, a few markets in the area are staying open late to accommodate the last minute shoppers. And I do have a piece of advice. If you haven't bought it yet, you better go out and get it. This is ridiculous. I've never seen so many crackers in my life. Here we go. Call it the last minute turkey trot, Thanksgiving Eve. We're buying stuff for Thanksgiving and it's a madhouse. It's a time for procrastinators, big and small, to engage in a frantic search for that perfect holiday feast. This is the supermarket. Oh, this is fun. This is fun. Ron Prozan came armed with a list from his wife. Broccoli crowns, two bags purple pearl onions and strict instructions not to deviate. And here are the crowns. I guess they call them florets. Hey, where am I going now? Let's go look for the onions. I think this is for the stuffing. Purple pearl onions, no problem. This is San Mateo's Drager's Market, where the upper crust doesn't just come on the pies. And a yam certainly isn't a sweet potato. The reality is life is sweet potatoes. You can get organic. I mean, the, the shop is great. But these are also wonderful things. I think we're very lucky. Uh, you know, today we're very, very lucky that most of us, the baby boomers, are very, very fortunate that we can afford this. We're in the beef section. Let's get some sausage. For soon-to-be newlyweds, Victoria Lockhart and Mike Ribeiro, the pressure is on. This Thanksgiving is a test run for many future family get-togethers. I love Thanksgiving because there's no gift giving. It's just a meal, with a family. good meal and family. And I love preparing the dinner with my mom. It's something we do every year. And it's just really special. And we're back live at Andronico's here in Berkeley. A few shoppers still here. About uh, 55 minutes before this store closes, of course, Pam, many others will stay open all night. But I can tell you they're running low on some uh, key Thanksgiving provisions. They've gone through about 200 fresh turkeys here, although they tell me they still have a few if you haven't gotten yours yet. Uh, you. Okay, and all that cranberry sauce. Yeah. you got to get that. Thanks, Laura. All right. There's a lot more ahead on Nightbeat tonight. Coming up, tired of telemarketers ruining your dinner, we'll show you how to make money off the people who make you miserable. We will remember the man who made Geraldine famous. Flip Wilson is dead at the age of 64. And Michael J. Fox reveals that he is fighting a debilitating disease that has no cure. You're watching New Center 4 Nightbeat with Pete Wilson, Pam Moore, meteorologist Steve Raleigh, and Gary Radnich on sports. News Center 4, 24-hour news, every day, every hour. are going home for the holidays. You'll find two-for-one specials throughout the store, and the first 700 guests will get this McFin Penguin free. Plus, get a certificate for 10% off when you spend $100 or more. Opens Friday at 7 a.m. New Center 4 closed captioning is sponsored by Sleep Train. New Center 4, proud to be the closed captioning leader in Northern California. Comedian Flip Wilson died tonight. He'd been suffering from liver cancer. He was 64 years old. The Flip Wilson Show was a huge hit from 1970 to 74. Wilson won two Emmys. His big break actually came a few years earlier as guest host of The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. His best-known characters were Leroy, pastor of the church of What's Happening Now, and Geraldine. Thank you, you are, uh, uh, Jardine, Jardine Jones, cool, calm, and here to collect, honey. Well, you gotta see it to believe it. Well, you better believe it, because you ain't gonna get to see it. 
<laughs> After leaving television, Flip Wilson devoted his time to raising his children. He was so funny. Wilson's publicist says he died in his sleep. Everybody did Geraldine oh, when he yeah. was doing it for those bad period of time. Yeah. Other stories we have been following the past 24 hours. Actor Michael J. Fox has Parkinson's disease. He was diagnosed seven years ago. In fact, in March, he had brain surgery to reduce the shaking. For 37 years old, that's very young for Parkinson's. It's a degenerative brain disorder similar to Alzheimer's. There are treatments, no cure. Napa police have a suspect in last week's ambush shooting that injured three high school students. A 17-year-old is expected to be charged with attempted murder. Police caught him Friday carrying a gun near school. Bullet casings match those from the crime scene. Police say the shooting was gang-related, and 150 families will enjoy Thanksgiving dinner courtesy of the San Francisco 49ers and the San Jose Police. Players handed out boxes of food tonight. This is the 13th year the team has sponsored the giveaway. In the early days, players actually delivered the meals door to door. That's become a little tougher. Well, coming up, Steve Raleigh with the holiday forecast. We're going to have tonight's winning lotto numbers. And Contact 4 shows us how to make money off those annoying telemarketers who keep calling you at home. And why some parents think the new movie about Babe the Pig in for children. It always seems to happen at the worst time. The phone rings. It's a telemarketer trying to sell you something, and it's annoying. But surprisingly, it can also be profitable. Contact Force Joe Ducey shows us how to turn those telemarketer calls into cash. Solicitations will be heard at the rate of $5 per minute. Door opening fee, $3. Just a glance at his suburban Los Angeles front door, and you know Bob Arco doesn't like solicitors. People have a right to be left alone. And he really doesn't like telemarketers. Please don't call me again. But after months of telemarketers ignoring him, months of these phone solicitors repeatedly trying to take his time and his money, Bob decided to turn pain into profit. Here's $1,000 from Bank of America. Okay. Here's 500 from Allstate Insurance. He and sued the telemarketers the and won. Big. How much do you think you've made so far? Over 13000 in three years. That's right, $13,000. Speak. 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 While the Bay Area's Lisa McCarty was teaching her dog to talk, she was trying to teach telemarketers to be silent. You need to be able to say no. Don't call me. But one business wouldn't take no for an answer. They called at all hours, dozens of times, month after month. It became harassment, and Lisa had enough. She threatened to sue. If you're going to call me, you know what? You're going to pay for it. Hello? I demanded $7,500, and voila, I blew this one up. I got $7,500. That's right, $7,500. So how did they do it? How did two people make $20,000 from telemarketers? Well, they used this, the FCC's Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It's seven years old, it's full of loopholes, but it also offers step-by-step -step instructions on how to get telemarketers to stop and offers major penalties if they don't. And you can do it yourself. Here's how. First, keep a log. Write down names, numbers, complaints, and times of calls. If the telemarketer doesn't properly identify themselves and you can prove it, a $500 penalty. Tell the caller to put you on their do not call list. That should last a year and it's required by law. If they call back anyway, you can sue for another $500 and then more. If they call again, it's $1,500 per call. Ask the telemarketer to send a copy of their do not call policy. It's a $1,500 penalty if they don't or can't. And it might be better for you if you can fax them a copy of your demands. Well, of course, that creates a, a bill on my phone. So if they say they didn't call, I could say, well, how did I get their internal fax number? While the law requires you to sue the telemarketers in small claims court, most of Bob's money and all of Lisa's okay. came in out of court settlements with just a threat. I want to be every telemarketer's worst nightmare. Bob now even has his own website, California's Against Telephone Solicitation, or CATS. Also check the websites for Private Citizen and the Federal Communications Commission. Joe Ducey with Contact 4. Well, that's some good advice. Indeed it is. Steve Raleigh and I agree that we keep getting called by the Chronicle. <laughs> wanting to I sell papers to us the other night again and I... again we work for the newspaper <laughs> well right? more than that i'm already <laughs> receiving it about as much as i possibly can just somehow they're dropping the ball there let's go ahead and show you forecast headlines around here just kidding mr Sias. i love i'm just kidding it's a joke
Clouds on the way. A wet holiday set for tomorrow. Some better weekend weather, though. Let's get started then for first thing in the morning. We're going to have a little bit of sunshine around here. So if you're getting off early, there's two things. It's going to be chilly in the morning because there's some clear skies out there. And there's going to be a little bit of sun. So if you're heading right out the door, you should be good. Later you go in the day, then we're talking about some problems. You'll see here by the satellite, look at all of this moisture now running up to the north. That's where it's been going. One thing I want to show you, though, things are going to change, and I'll show you how. See this right here? Look at all that moisture. It's going to get fed right up into this system, and then the whole thing is going to head toward us. And in fact, what's happening is this cold front's coming first. That's what's going to hit late tomorrow. And then in Friday, we're going to get this, what we call this post-frontal trough, like another front. And so that means we get double dose, neither of which are going to carry a lot of rain. It's going to rain, but I don't think it's going to be any way like a washout. One of the other things, too, I want to point out, we're going to see some cold air in here long about Friday night into the first part of Saturday. Probably the coldest of the season, so get ready for that. All right, let me show you what's happening then across the state. You'll see we're going to have some wet weather up into the north coast, but otherwise you're looking pretty good all across the state for tomorrow. Uh, at least until later in the day, as I mentioned, when the rain comes in. Closer look at Tahoe. In case you're heading up there, do a little skiing. It looks like fine tomorrow, as I mentioned. Friday, might get some fresh powder. It's going to be kind of uh, snowy there. And then you'll see things improve a little bit. Maybe a chance of some snow showers uh, through the weekend. Uh, shall we give you a little bit of dose of uh, what's happening up there? Yes, instead of Plymouth Rock, it was heavenly today. The pilgrims coming down the slopes. <laughs> you just don't get enough of pilgrims on snowboards. Anyway, now you get a sense of, well, there you go, why they call it heavenly, huh? Okay, so have a nice day. like it'll cooperate. Certainly will, for the most part, around the Bay Area, as I say. Uh, in the afternoon, eve, uh, evening hours, that's when we'll see some drop, but it's not going to be a major deal. Temperatures in the upper 50s and 60s. In fact, it very well could happen like when everybody's already at their destination. So here's the story, then we'll keep it kind of wet for the next couple of days, but then it improves going into Saturday and Sunday. And I guess for all of the, um, uh, retail folks, they like to see maybe a few drops because that'll keep everybody in the malls and all of the different places for some power shopping on Friday, too, <laughs> for the folks. All right, here's your pink slip there, cutting the last check. <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> Gary is next. He has sports, uh, Cal basketball, Jerry Rice. And Stanford at the NIT gets the first serious scare of its top ranked season. And later, why a pig in the uh, country, city rather is worth a lot of controversy. Center for Sports. Good evening, everybody. Stanford ventured on to America's brightest sporting stage this evening, waiting at Madison Square Garden. Homestanding upstart St. John's Bobby Bonilla traded back to the New York Mets. He's hanging out. Stanford down 10 with 6.19 to play, but they're on the comeback trail. Art Lee glides to the goal, and Stanford has wiped out the advantage. They're up a point. 53-51 Stanford. Ron Artest. Count the goal, we're tied, our test, a chance late to give St. John's a lead, but no, no, no. And Lee, when he's fouled on the play, injures his lower abdomen, but he's got enough when he steps to the free throw line to drop home a pair, and Stanford would hang on 55-53, not the way Art Lee wanted to be carried off the floor, but his coach Mike Montgomery says tonight, he'll be all right uh, come Friday. Preseason NIT championship game, Stanford, North Carolina, the Tar Heels beat Purdue, and a game that just became a final. Iowa State in overtime, two points better than St. Mary's. Uh, there is a reason Eastern Washington is on Cal's schedule. Pick up a pre-Pac-10 victory at the uh, Coliseum Arena. Ben, Brom ben plays. You're going to win by 30. Gino Carlisle, he had 17 points to lead the Bears. They announced the crowd, 7,956. And Sean Lampley says, let me make the highlights. And when you dunk, we're all suckers for dunks. 16 points, 10 boards, 94-63 Cal. Saturday, the Bears visit uh, Chicago to play the DePaul Blue Demons. Uh, one national final of note. Maui Classic, Syracuse 76, Indiana 63, that in the championship game. Sharks and Hurricanes, Keith Primo beat Mike Vernon. They're not drawing for hockey in Carolina, only 6,037 to watch Ray Shepard beat Mike Vernon. Sharks remain the only team in the NHL without a victory 
on the road this season. They're 4, 10, and 5, poorest in the National Hockey League. Ricky Henderson's representatives have leaked out word tonight that Henderson more than likely will leave the A's again, saying the club cannot afford him. Henderson made roughly $1 million last season. Boy, the uh, Yankees sure came up with the jack for Bernie Williams. Seven years, $87.5 million to stay with the Yankees. That's $12.5 million a year. And there's your new king, Mo Vaughn. Mo Vaughn is leaving the Red Sox for the California Angels. Six years, $80 million. $13.3 million a year. So the pecking order as we speak, Mo Vaughn per year, the highest paid player. Piazza at second. Bernie Williams and Pedro Martinez tied for third. Good news for Angel fans, though. They now have Mo Vaughn. Jerry Rice's teammates came to his defense today in regards to uh, get me the ball flap of earlier this week. I just think uh, the man wanted the opportunity to make some plays for the offense. And uh, it's funny because Terrell and myself do it all the time. But the fact that Jerry Rice is saying it, I think everybody blew it kind of out of proportion. So, you know, we're, we're past it and we're looking forward to this week's game. He, he, I, he just wanted to make plays for the team. New York Giants, Monday night at Candlestick. Through the years, Bowler of the Night on Thanksgiving Eve has always provided holiday thrills. In fact, we're going international tonight. Carlos Ocampo from Mexico City is here in our great city. Let's make him feel at home from Mexico City. Carlos Ocampo. You're darn right. And how serious is our staff? We have two cameras at these things now, and you're seeing one of our photographers being photographed. He's a little more excited than we are about it, but nonetheless, uh, two cameras shooting this tonight. That man's name is J.C. Lockhart. He's a part-time employee, and more moves like that, we'll see to it that it's part-time employment. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Well, yeah. coming up why a new movie about a little pink pig has parents seen red. When the movie Babe came out a few years back, it really delighted audiences and the critics. It made a hero out of a pig, and it made a bundle of money for the producers. Well, now the sequel is out. It's called Babe, a Pig in the City, and it has some parents wondering how it ever got a G rating. Mark Jones reports. La, 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 la. These are the trailers for Babe, a Pig in the City. They show you the movie's cutest moments, which you don't see until you pay your money is a dark, Grimm's fairy tale. I attended the first screening this afternoon in Pleasant Hill. Here are the concepts your child will have to deal with in the movie. In the first two minutes, the pig's master falls down a scary well and is crippled and faces bankruptcy. Then there is a fire in a children's hospital, the death of a family breadwinner, friends being shot, homelessness and starvation, betrayal. The Mercier family had seen the original movie. What did you think? We were really disappointed. It was not a ch appropriate for the little ones that we took. We thought it shouldn't have been a G movie, actually. It was just actually um, very violent for them. We were constantly having to explain um, why the animals were getting hurt, and it just didn't seem appropriate at all for the little ones that we took with. It was scary. It was very scary, actually. They didn't like it one tiny bit. Rita Mercier felt misled by the promise of the original Babe and the new version's G rating. Well, I sat there and took notes, and the concepts that we were talking about included death, fire, dogs barking at you in the dark, betrayal. I don't even, we really should have left. I'm sorry that we didn't walk out of it. I think it's, I, I, I just think it's wrong to but do this. But they're doing this to families on Thanksgiving weekend, the biggest movie weekend of the year. It's awful. And they, and they got trapped. If you don't believe two grown-ups, take it from a stunned four-year-old. Did you see the first Babe movie? Yes. Did you like it? Yeah. Yeah? Babe is still a hero, but the rest of the movie was boy. No fun, huh? No. In Pleasant Hill, Mark Jones, New Center 4, on the night beat. Well, that last young lady had an ally in New Center 4 film critic Jan Wall. She gave the film no hats, and she called it a cruel Thanksgiving hoax. Yeah, it's been mentioned in most of the reviews that, it, that young kids are going to have a hard time with this. Well, from the file in Stamford, Connecticut, Ed Aragi was unhappy with a clerical error at the local People's Bank branch, so he dragged a carcass of a de deer, deer that he had just killed into the bank, placed it on the counter, and refused to remove it till they straightened out his account. Florida police report that a 77-year-old Palm Harbor man got stuck in the mud behind his home yesterday and was attacked by several large alligators. He managed to fight all of them off with his cane. And there is a new website that has opened up for complaints about your boss, myboss.com. This week's winner, a boss who answered complaints about the lack of variety in his employees' jobs by shouting over the intercom, sheep don't need variety. 
that's Nightbeat for tonight. Have a good night, everybody, and a good Thanksgiving. So long, folks.